This is how the kit comes wrapped in the brown paper and string just to give that authentic uh, Second World War feel. Uh, what actually comes in the kit, let's start off, the manual, which is uh, not a copy of, but it looks very like the Spitfire manual that uh, the pilots used during the Second World War, and it contains all the details that you, you require to put the kit together. Next we've got the actual flat parts. Anyone that's built the balsa wood models will recognise the shape of this. The acceptor parts are already cut out with laser, which means they're very accurate. This is the brass version, but we also do a stainless steel version. Next, we've got some wet and dry, 600 grit. Next, we've got a name tag on the bottom and some felt for the bottom of the base. This is the hardwood stand. A junior hacksaw for cutting some of the stringers. This is the stand with a fully lockable ball joint for positioning the plane. A set of preformed uh, propellers blades. Some cotton bloods, which I'll explain later. This is the spinner assembly, which is all fully machined. A small pack of pins and screws. A needle file for cleaning up some of the burrs. A couple of formed components, which is the front and rear canopy. struts for putting the frame together and last but not least the main stem which everything is built around. This is how the flat parts come and obviously I've got two sets laid out here. This is the stainless steel version and this is the brass version. They're both cut with uh, laser so they're accurate. Some of the early kits that are sold were water jet but the technique is exactly the same. Parts are tagged in with little tags and you push them out until you can get a hold of them and then just rock them very gently about the tag until they mark the part. You'll just feel it just fracture and comes out. Don't try to be too aggressive and force it all in one. Again, they come out very easily, so it's not something you need to rush. the same for the stainless steel. Uh, just tweeze it out till you can get the fingers on it and then just rock the part very gently and you'll feel the part fracture. Some of the larger parts you don't need to use a needle file or something pointy to get a hold of it. But the main thing is don't try to force it. Just short gentle rocking movements and the part will come out. Don't worry that this one isn't cut in half, but it will be when it's in the kit. Once the parts have been broken out, this is what you'll, you'll have. And it is quite important to put a little bit of thought in of how you're going to store the parts. Uh, what you don't want to do is to, to scratch them or damage them, particularly once you've done the, the uh, started work on the polishing stage. But long before you get to the polishing or the gluing stage, it's very, very important that you do a dry fit. You've got to put all these parts together without glue. And the main reason for this is you've got to test every one of the notches to make sure that it's a good fit and it's not too tight. And it also helps you to familiarize yourself of where the parts are going. Now what we do is start off with the main stem, which everything is built around. Now you need to consult the, the manual just so you make sure that you know where everything, each one of the parts goes. It's fairly intuitive but you, you've got to make sure it's right. We start off with the main part of the fuselage. 
And I say, it's important, you don't want these to be too tight a fit. It's not as bad a tight fit on here, but not on the top, because once the glue goes on, it will be very fiddly to put the parts together. And the other wing. I say you can do this as many times as you'd like until you've got the, the feel of where all the parts go. too far wrong with these wing pieces because they're all one length. They'll only fit in one, one position. And the other wing. This one is a little more fiddly than the rest because it interlocks with these two components. That's why it's important that you get these the right way around. just a little tight and I'll just need a little bit of easing just to make it go in. Okay now we'll head for the tail section. Now when you get this and you put it together like that you might find this one is okay when it's come together but you might find that that's just a little bit tight to push in. What you need to do is get the needle file and just take a break that top edge. Don't take any off the full bottom edge because you need that as a to locate. Just break the top corner. It's just be a bar on there. Just enough to allow it to slide in and then push forward. There's other components go on the tail and you can't really go too far wrong because they all the height of them really tells you where they go. Now I mentioned earlier that we, you don't want too tight a fit. If you're going to have any of the component, uh, any of the notches tight, you can make the ones in the, the join the stem tight, just so the components stand upright and are not flopping about too much. But what you don't want is the top components too tight, because particularly when you've got the glue on, if they're too tight it will become too fiddly to press the tail together. Okay. When you're putting the parts together, work from the bottom one and align them all the way up. It's a little bit fiddly, but this is the idea of the drive fit. Just so you can get your technique together. And now you have the tail. Next thing we'll do is the front of the fuselage. And these two components here, it's easy to tell which notch they go because of the size. What's not so easy is to tell which way up it goes. Now the technique is there's notches at the top which are closer together than the notches at the bottom and that's the way they go around when you put them together the idea of the dry fit is you want to be able to put it together and you want to check that all the the notches along the side line up automatically again this is the last piece start from this one and feed them in. I say it's a little bit tricky but this is the idea of the, the dry fit to 
practice your technique for getting the notches in. And it's one of the reasons why you don't want to make these too tight at this stage when you put the glue on, you don't want to get too panicky. And the last two components, just to check, is the parts that link onto the spinner. And these have got a couple of notches to tell you which part, which way is top and which way is bottom. This one goes on first. And such. And the second one, showing you the notch to the top. These need quite a bit more work at a later stage, these two components, but they're described in a later section. Well, it's important at the early stage to do a bit of planning, just to think about where you're going to store the components, cleaning your workbench down and laying it out uh, properly. It, it sounds obvious, but it really does make a big difference. Not only to protect yourself from the health and safety aspects, but also to protect the component. What you don't want to do is spend a long time polishing up a component just to throw it down on a workbench that's got grit or dirt or whatever and to re-scratch it. It doesn't matter for the brass components if they oxidise, because you can take that away very, very quickly. What you don't want to do is re-scratch it. So a wee bit of time and preparation and planning out how you're going to, where you're going to put all the parts and how you're going to store them really does make a difference. Now everything that you, you need to build the kit, except the super glue, is contained within the kit. However, some people have tools within the garage, which if they've got them, great. It will help to speed up the process. Some of these things include a multi-tool type, which is a felt bobbin used for polishing some of the components, or the little sanding head for cleaning up some of the edges, which is very useful, or even the cutting head for cutting some of the stringers is very, very useful. But again, not necessary if you don't have one. Another thing that some people use is a palm sander, just to speed up the process. Again, but there's definitely alternatives if you don't have the palm sander. You get a, a needle file as part of the kit. If you've got a larger file, as long as it's got a fine cut, that can be speed up the process. Uh, a little vise is very, very useful. Uh, I use the one that's mounted to my bench. If you're not as lucky to have one mounted to your bench, this type is very inexpensive. The main thing to remember, it must have a plain jaw. So when you tighten it up, it, it doesn't leave marks on your components. And these mount to the tables. This is just a couple of different varieties. Another thing that I find quite useful, if you've got one great, it's a, called a carol sander which you put uh, some of the wet and dry around a drum and you stick that in your drill and you can do some of the edges a lot faster. But again, all it's there for is speeding up the process. If you don't have it, you can still complete the task. It just takes that little bit longer. For the health and safety, if you're using some of this, these items, it is important that you read the manufacturer's instructions and keep yourself safe. The components that are supplied in the kit, be very aware of the likes of the sharp point. Make sure you put the glasses on just to protect your eyes. When you're doing the bending around here, you don't want any accidents. And if you're storing super glue, and lacquers and paints, follow the instructions on the, on the tin. You've got to keep yourself safe. <laughs>